time, the three bears were coming back. And, and when they came back, they saw that, that um, they, they said in a big voice, the first one said, who's been eating my porridge? And then the second one, who's been eating my porridge? And then the little one, who said in a very light voice, who's been eating my porridge? And they eating it all up. Hello, are you Paul by any chance? Hello Paul, I'm Steve. I used to go to school here a long time ago. Uh, it was from 78 to 85 and I was in Maxwell. They still have the same yeah. houses? Yeah. You can go in here, yeah? This is where I did my first ever concert performance. Wow. And it hasn't changed at all. And it was a school disco, 1980, and I was so nervous I couldn't stand up because my legs were shaking so much. So I just sat here on the side of the stage and played my guitar. I sat right here, shaking like a leaf. And I had a microphone, I had to sing as well and I couldn't stand to look at anyone so I was like looking down all the time. I was very bad at sport as you can imagine. You're either good at music or you're good at sport. I've never known anyone good at both. su niño estaba enfermo. Su mamá estaba triste y a los pocos días fueron al hospital y le dijo al doctor que tenía mal el corazón. A los 15 días murió. Su mamá lloraba y lloraba y gritaba, ha muerto mi hijo, le decía a todo el vecindario para que la consolaran. Y entonces fue con el doctor y le dijo, mi hijo ha muerto. El doctor se puso triste aunque no fuera su hijo y fue una vida infeliz.
All right. So just take one with your left hand, any one you like. Okay. You know, wherever you feel like going. And turn it over? Yeah. Well, that's very much about where you are right now. A sense of adventure. Moving into the unknown. Do you see anything? Coloured rainbow type. Yeah. Spectrum of light. Yeah, rainbow. All the colours of the rainbow. A sense of abundance coming to you. בקרוב הוא מוציא את אלבום הסולו הראשון שלו, קבלו את סטיבן וויסון! Yeah, he's here somewhere. We're making a documentary about... Uh, about about me. you. <laughs> well, it's about me, very loosely about me. It's more about what it's like to be a musician in the 21st century. And, of course, Israel being my second home, I definitely wanted to come here and, and do some filming. If Israel is a second home, why can't you speak Hebrew? going to enjoy school you had to be kind of good at sports and I was I was good at music music was more of a kind of a, a solitary thing you know I mean you go home and you you'd listen to music and you learn to play your instrument and you try to write songs while the kids were out sort of playing football and skateboarding and stuff so being into sports was a more social thing but I had a few very good friends that were into music too that formed my first band with you know the band I played with in the in the in the main assembly hall there the first time was a heavy metal band called Paradox. It wasn't a particularly encouraging place for me. Uh, you know, a few good teachers and, and a few friends and... and uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't wait to get away from it. Not, I don't want to give you an idea that it was miserable. It wasn't a miserable experience, but it was just kind of dull, you know. It's not the most um, dynamic, probably, school. This is the dining dining room. Ah, we own. We own to the Kent. Is that a sort of code or something? These are things that my dad made for me when I was a kid. I couldn't afford. Obviously, I couldn't afford to buy a lot of gear. We're talking about the sort of 80s here. I wanted to get sounds that I was hearing on the records I was listening to. I would say to my dad, uh, I want to get that sound, Dad, and I would sort of play him a record by Beatles or 
Tangerine Dream or something like that. And he would go off and he would build these things for me. And this is, um, he built me like a sequencer. He built me uh, a, a delay, a tape delay machine. And this is actually a vocoder and it still works. Quite recently I've used it. The vocoder I actually got out of a magazine. That was one of these sort of practical electronics or something other. And um, I just happened to see it and I thought, oh, I've always, I've always sort of um, liked the idea of a vocoder. I'll have got building one. <laughs> this actually is a little multi-track cassette machine. Now, when I started to make music, th these things called portable uh, Porter Studios had just come out. They were little cassette-based uh, machines that you could multi-track record on. In other words, you could overdub yourself playing different instruments and then mix. I really wanted one of these and um, obviously I couldn't afford it. I was like 12 years old or something. And my dad said, never mind about that, I'll, I'll make you one. And he did. On the multi-track, little four-track, you put a pitch control. Oh yes, so I did, yes. With a really extreme one. Mm. I mean, you yeah. might get one that subtly allows you to, but yours yeah. was really extreme. Right. So I could use that while I was recording sounds to, to create really weird effects. Yes, I, did, I didn't remember doing that. And also the other thing you probably remember is that this doesn't have any erase head. Oh no, that's right. No, you had to use pre-blank tapes, didn't you? Yeah. So I had to basically, because it doesn't have any erase head, anything I recorded, if I got it wrong, I couldn't erase it. No. I had to start again. Or I could go over it again. Yes. But you would still hear the underneath thing underneath too. Yes, yeah. Good gym. I didn't spend any time in there, don't worry. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been in that room. Five years, seven years I was here. Oh blimey, look at that. I've got the lyrics written out by my friend Malcolm. Now Malcolm was the guy that I originally dreamt up the ridiculous concept of a porcupine tree with, and he wasn't a musician, kind of inspiring me to make this kind of music. So here we got we got his lyrics to a song called Towel, which I think in the end was an instrumental. And uh, that's his speech from Yellow Hedro Dreamscape. Open your heart to the universe. It was kind of cosmic psycho babble. It was kind of pastiching, kind of 60s, 70s, cosmic hippie sort of approach to doing things. And that's dated January the 4th, 1989. Here we are, almost 20 years ago. SWHQ here. Oh, wow. See, obviously, that's set up for bass communion and stereo. That isn't is it? brilliant. It is. Foghorn station. But look, it's got, yeah, it's got these giant things. It's obviously using pressurised air to uh, get out the, the notes. It's fantastic. And I got a shot of an in between one as well. Postcard fares. Not as that's the best. Beautifully isn't it? strange, isn't that it? That is strange, beautiful, you're it right. Is. Strange, beautiful, we like. But we also like decay.
Well, it's funny because people ask me quite a lot why they train so much in my songs, and there's a there's a lot of references to trains and specifically decay and uh, a kind of nostalgic view of trains. I grew up not right next to a station, but quite near to a station. And now I have this kind of association of sound and feeling when I hear the sound of a train, particularly the sound of a train pulling into a station. And it, it's almost like that kind of Proustian thing where a certain event, trivial or otherwise, triggers off a whole kind of series of, of memories, feelings, smells, sights, sounds. And it all comes from just lying in bed when I was very young, hearing the sound of these trains kind of hissing in and out of the station. But definitely the association with trains has always been a slightly nostalgic one for me because I've never, I've, I've not really used trains since I was a kid, you know. I'm very lazy and I'm very, I'm very happy just to get to my car and drive off and I'll never get on, on a train unless I absolutely have to. So m trains are kind of somehow preserved in, in aspect for me in, as a particular part of my childhood. It's interesting, growing up in a small town, I, I think maybe does give you more of a sense of, of wanderlust and, and uh, a passion and a curiosity for discovering, you know, well, there must be more, you know, there must be more out there. I'm gonna walk, I'm, I'm living just nearby. Uh, I haven't decided, I haven't decided which song yet. Yeah, it's rock, it's rock and roll man, we just, we just make it up as we go along, it's rock and roll, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. I can't, uh, I can't get excited by an age where all music is just like a piece of software that you download into a little thing like that, and then I can't. Still got the live shows. Yeah, but I can't get excited about the, the you know, I still, I still love to collect 
I just still love to buy albums and stuff, you know, right. and see artwork and collect and file, you know, alphabetically, yeah. chronologically. Yeah. Okay, you Redemption know. song. Okay, all right. Song. I love this man, you see? This guy. <laughs> The darkies. He's my Schindler list of Why me. Why don't we just change he our took, name uh, to the Israeli darkies. musician and took me out from Israel. <laughs> like Schindler list, you know, the film. Yeah. I'm the Oscar Schindler. Yeah. So you, you want like a, a breakfast? Yeah. Yeah, let's go and... Um... here in Tel Aviv and as you can see the uh, bombers and the terrorists all around us. Uh, I think a lot of people are terrified about the you know the political situation here but I've been here maybe 50 60 times over the last seven years now. And you don't see any iPods here as well it's fantastic. If you actually go into Tel Aviv you don't see people with iPods. It's almost like they can't be bothered with iPods. They'd much rather hear live music or, you know, or listen to music at home. And that's so refreshing. Israelis are very interactive people. It's not like they walk around, you know, avoiding eye contact like they do in other cities in the world. They're always out to make friends and communicate and, and uh, meet new people. not as closed and self-conscious as I used to be, I think. It's the one place that's changed me more than anything else. In a good way, I think. I'm much more relaxed on stage as well than I used to be. I used to spend the whole show staring at my shoes, you know. But now I'm much more relaxed on stage, I'm much more relaxed as a musician, I'm much more relaxed as a person about my life and not so kind of stressed out about where have I got to, where am I going, what am I looking for in life, all this stuff that I think you're obsessed with when you're like 20, 25, 30. And the first time I came to Israel I was in my very early 30s and I really, maybe I began to change at that time anyway, but Israel really kind of helped to change the way I, I uh, thought about what was important in life, you know. The most important thing for me, well, there's two important things. One of them is to feel like you've, you've left something behind, of, of uh, some kind of legacy behind, of some importance and significance. I'm talking about, you know, this is, I'm talking about the work now. Um, And the other is, uh, can we interview you as well? Where are you from? From London. Yeah. What are you, a musician? Yeah. What's your name? Steve Wilson. <laughs> what kind of music do you make? Weird shit.
Press the little button on the side. Yep. Okay. Lean into it. Whoa, whoa, do you really need to put that in the lyrics? Well, you know, some people, they were, you know. This song seems to be called Cheese, I like that. Mm. Cheese. Um, <laughs> Just because he has a word cheese on it. No, I think it's called Cheer, actually, but oh. the way he's written it looks like it could be Cheese, which I think is a better type of person. Yeah. How do you, if you're a record company, how do you sell the same album to the same person four times? You sell the vinyl, you sell the CD, you sell a remastered CD, and now the definitive version, the Japanese LP replica. No, it's crap. And again, mate, sorry. The Fairy Symphony, how prog is that? Can you imagine anything more prog than an album called The Fairy Symphony? It's got to be good, right? Oh, yes. Been looking for that one. It's hard to find now, that one. Caravan in the Land of Grey and Pink. It's hard to find this one in this, in this format. Good one? Oh, very good. Very good. I have that too. This one, it's a good record. I like this. It's, uh, sounds like a fairy tale. It's a very strange record. I like it. No, I like it a lot. It's got my comfort on it. I think I have another one with it. That's also a... Fine old Tom. This has my Coalfield on it. He's not credited. I love these Japanese. That's not with the sound of that. No, but it's, it's a great record. It's, you know, it's, it's okay. <laughs> Sloth, this is an amazing track. Sloth. Sloth, yeah. These days, a cover, a cover representation of a music, has been reduced to just a piece of paper in a crystal case, isn't it? I mean, a vinyl cover was something really tangible and aesthetic. You could actually hold it in your hands. You could feel the texture. It was a huge. It was like a painting. It was the size of a painting. To me, the cover is part of the piece. You know, the music on the CD or the record or whatever it is is part of the presentation, and the other part of the presentation is the artwork. I've never really considered the two to be separate. I've never understood why some musicians are happy to make a great record and then put it in a sort of functional piece of shit sleeve, you know, like the Benz or OK Computer. Great records, shit sleeves. Such a disappointment. And visually, so many artists just don't seem to give a shit about the, the way their art's presented. I've never understood that. You know, I grew up in a time when it was all vinyl. And, and you know, you, when you were listening to the records, you were kind of, uh, you were reading the credits, you were kind of feeling the texture of the paper and the card, and you were kind of just, you know, holding the thing. It was pouring over it, you know, absorbing everything you could. And CDs kind of did away with all that. CDs would kind of reduce music to the level of software instead of art. And I think that's the problem. And to be fair, CDs have got a lot better. You know, for 10 years or so, they were just, so functional and I think now there's a kind of trend back towards a movement back towards packaging and and a more visual aesthetic with the way music is presented I think partly because people are, uh, are beginning to realize that unless you give people something nice visually they're just gonna download it there's no reason to to buy a CD unless you give them something that they really feel they want to own Yeah, what next? Now, of course, you've got many people who are listening to music and their, their visual companion to that is a little icon on an iPod screen. That's really a heavy hammer. Yeah. 
Tell me about it. If you're into really great sounding records and listening to them from vinyl, you know, if you were to get yourself a, you know, a really good stereo and a deck and the whole bit and listen to, say, you know, really good pressings of, of stuff like Year of the Cat by Al Stewart or, you know, beautifully engineered by the Alan Parsons guy, it's mm. absolutely wonderful. Mm. And, you know, pretty much any Pink Floyd album, you know, any Queen record, it's, they sound terrific. Mm. Then play the then play the MP3 through the same system straight afterwards, and you get the shot of your life. You well, realise what you've been listening to. <laughs> I, I totally agree. But isn't part of the problem now that there's a whole generation of kids growing up thinking that MP3s is how music is supposed to sound? Yeah. And they'll never get the opportunity to hear the alternative. Well, they do in a funny sort of way because may, maybe that's you know live sounds definitely getting better. And uh, people like to go to live shows because it sounds big and exciting. God is fashion. God is pain. God gives meaning. God gives pain. You'll be right like me. We've got it all in our hearts and souls. I got a halo around me. I got a halo around me. And now I'm saying I share because I've seen the light and I'm beginning in faith now. I got a halo around me. The theory from Stanford University in California has outraged music purists, including the British Grammy-nominated musician Stephen Wilson. Such is his fury that he's captured his violent loathing of MP3 players on camera. Stephen is with me to explain why. Why do you think the old iPod is the devil's plaything? Uh, well, there's three basic issues for me. The first reason is the quality it is very poor. It's, for me, it's like the equivalent of looking at a photocopy of a beautiful painting. It's a very compressed convenient way of listening to something that actually should be listened to at the highest possible level. It's a piece of art, after all. Gospel Oak. Oh, it's a good cover, though. Yeah, but it's not, that's why I bought it. But yeah. It's not good. Shit. This is now my favourite record, one of my favourites of all time. It's a great record. So <laughs> Can you sing us a song, Suze? Which song? Uh... Uh, no, sing your Tokyo Hotel song. No. Why? It's embarrassing. Because I don't even like Tokyo Hotel. Yes, you do. You love that song. No, I do. And you think the singer's super hot? Well... There are some albums where, I mean, like that one we just looked at, the, uh, I forget what it was now, where the cover's great, but the record's shit. That one, I love this cover. Yeah. But all his covers have got that, like the Spring cover and the Black Sabbath and the, mm. the second Dando Shaft album. Do you have that one? That one. Mm. I love that one. Mm. The burnt out uh, merry-go-round here. And then this one he did. Yeah. He's a genius. Yeah, but where is he? If you're in a metal or like a death metal band, like for, you know, parts of us are still death metal, yeah. you're in a way, your taste is kind of limited to dark type well, of pictures. Yeah, you know? dark, yeah, but why, why are so many metal covers so extraordinarily cliched and tasteless? Because that's what the audience wants. Because the music. Is, is it that? Is it the audience driving? driving? Okay. Usually, if you hear a, like a, a band that you like mu musically, usually they have. A, a kind of design for their albums that you like too, you know, at least that's the case for me. Well, normally I would say that's true, but with metal bands it's hardly ever true. No, because there's not hardly many good metal true. bands. It's, it's the fun. Yeah, which is such a cliche. Now, is it because that's what their audience want? Or is it just because they haven't got any other ideas? We don't do it, you know, our pictures, they're the same, we just do like bumps. Because I can, you know, like for photo sessions, when I don't know what type of photos a metal band should have, but what I see is like this. Yeah. You know, yeah. every metal hammer cut, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's the cliche. You yeah. know, and I can't do that. Yeah. I've done a few and I just see, and like, and I see those people, I see in my eyes, I'm suffering. I just did a photo session with Angela from Arch Enemy mm -hmm. for the a cover of a magazine. Mm -hmm. And she went with, with I, was even, I was standing with a sword. <laughs> like, like this. Oh, that one's going framed on my wall. 
<laughs> and it was like almost like from the bad news. Yeah, Warriors. You got scared. to look mean. <laughs> That's what I felt like. like Hang Homestead, you're always looking for those little um, inspirations, you know, whether it's just going down to the local library and finding uh, in the music section a, a Frank Zappa album or something like that. And, and in a way, I kind of feel sorry for kids now because they have so many more advantages and it's so much easier for them. It's like, for me, discovering a Frank Zappa or, or a Pink Floyd record in the local library was a, a kind of epiphanal moment you had to really work for it and you had to if you wanted to hear music you had to decide um, I mean I can only afford to buy one record every month you know with my pocket money so you go down to our price records as it was then in, in Marlowe's and you'd look through the records and you had to make a really big decision about which music am I going to invest my time and my money and my energy in this time and then when you bought that record and you took it home you you devoured it for days and days and days and you decoded it and you tried to find anything you could from it that would inspire you. And of course now, because kids can just download uh, not just a record by an artist, but the entire back catalogue by an artist in a few seconds, they can dismiss it just as easily. So if, if you know, a kid hears now about Pink Floyd and he wants to check them out or the Beatles, he wants to check them out, he goes to the internet, he downloads everything, doesn't cost him a penny, takes him a few minutes, can listen to a few tracks, if it doesn't sort of connect immediately, erase. Erase, 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 erase. Well, so he knocks me out, he gives me that. I don't know, they don't do it anymore. They used to do like this gas thing. Nowadays, it's all like local anaesthetic, but in those days, it was gas. It would knock you out. You'd wake up, and uh, the dentist would have finished whatever he was going to do, rip your teeth out, whatever it was. So anyway, in this dream, I'm at the dentist, and uh, I wake up from this. Instead of removing my tooth, he, like, hands me my head, and it's in this kind of glass goldfish bowl. And I take it from him and I put it under my arm. And uh, so I'm carrying my, my head under my arm and I'm walking out of the dentist's surgery. And the dentist and the dental nurse are like standing at the top of the steps, smiling and waving. It's like something out of fucking Little House on the Prairie or something. And as I'm walking down the steps with my head, I like trip over and I fall down the steps and my head rolls down the steps and it rolls across the road and on the other side of the road there's like this field of corn and my head rolls into this field of corn and out of sight and I'm crawling across the road on my hands and knees and I'm crawling into this cornfield searching with my hands to try and find this I'm dreaming in reverse.
Steve. Steve, ¿qué estás haciendo? Steve. Steve, ¿qué estás haciendo? I don't know what me is. I don't know what, it's like David Bowie said, I don't really know what the real David Bowie is myself. And I think, I don't know what real me is either. OK, well, nice to meet you, man. I think we're going to go and find a tea or something. Have a good time. Mr Wilson. Yes. Hey, um, can I be really rude and get a picture, please? OK, that's not really rude. <laughs> Excuse me? Can you get a picture, please? Okay. okay. Thanks, Thank man. You. Thank you. Okay. Last one. We're gonna get some tea. Thank you. Okay. Very okay. nice. Thanks. Enjoy. Science block, right, still. Design and technology, yeah. And what do they do with this block now? It's an IT block. Okay, because it used to be called the inquiry block when I was here. And I never really figured out what inquiry was. This is basically a civilization now that kind of amused itself to the point of catatonia almost. And that's why we have programs like American Idol and, and Celebrity Big Brother and Cele I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here and this kind of stuff. It, it's it's become mind-numbing, really. And music now has been reduced, particularly with the kind of whole kind of American Idol, pop idol thing. Music has been reduced to this kind of charade where people who really should be doing, you know, if they're musicians at all, they should be singing on cruise ships or in wine bars. You know, that's about the level of creativity they have. But instead, they're being elevated to this level of, of you know, music icons, music superstars, and inspiring a whole generation of people after them. To, uh, to aspire to that too, that the most important thing in life is to be famous. The whole thing about American Idol is it's almost a way for the, the music business to regain control of music, of pop music, because they were really losing control of it. I mean, if you, if you think back to the kind of post-grunge sort of Nirvana era, when a lot of the most important rock music again was coming out of independent labels, kids making music in their bedroom, and the way the, the major music business, the big record labels, found to kind of regain that ground was to create this, literally create, manufacture. I mean, they've always manufactured, you know, bands in the past. When you go back to the Bay City Rollers and stuff like that, they've always manufactured music, but at least they were a little bit more subtle about it. They tried to perpetuate the myth that these bands actually had 
you know, come together through their own volition and created and written their own songs. Now they don't even pretend. They actually put the whole charade up on the screen for you and say, look, we're manufacturing this. This is a complete fake and you're still going to buy it. Slayer's Rain in Blood, 29 minutes. Pet Sounds, 35 minutes. Revolver, 33 minutes. The Notorious Bird Brothers, 28 minutes. Classic albums all. They expect music, to, they expect it to be crammed as if you can sort of buy music by the yard. We get fans complaining. There's not enough on it. We, we, our last Would you album, have had that with Fear and Blank Panic? Our last, yeah, that was 50 minutes long, that album. We've yeah. had people complaining that for their 10 bucks or whatever it is they pay on Amazon, that it wasn't 60, 70 minutes plus. It was only 50 minutes long. And I'm like, well, well I'm sorry. That's so madness. They can't be the real fan. Of course it is. Fan. Kids listen to music off their fucking phone. I saw, I saw some guy standing at bus stop the other day listening to. <laughs> what do you think of I mean, for goodness sake. MP3 off this little. Oh my god. That's the most tragic of all. But you know what? I think you're right. This music, in, like in the 70s and even in the 80s when I was growing up, music was the number one way that you would use to define your personality as distinct from your parents personality so you get to a certain age and you kind of you're you're a chip off the old block you're, you're you're like a mini version of your parents you get to a certain age and you start to rebel against your parents and the number one way to do that when i was growing up and i'm sure when you guys were growing up was music you get into david bow you get to pete floyd you get into the smiths or whatever it was gary newman now i don't think music is the number one way that kids rebel I think it's, as you say, it's all this other shit like computer games or kind of trainers you wear or... This band here, this is Amber Dawn actually, this is Mark. Now Mark was, was really, he lived around the corner. Yes. He was my first musical sort of companion. School friend. He was a school friend, but he was the one who was into music. So we From six. Yeah. Knew when he was and six. his brother, his big brother had a big record collection and all the music that we like, we first heard things like Camel, Hawkwind, Yes, all, he had those in his record collection. And we formed this band called Amber Dawn. And this guy here is Richard Haywood. Do you remember Richard? Mm. He was a bit older than us, but he was, I don't remember how we found out, found him. Oh, yeah. But yeah, this is, so this is Mum's dining room, which permanently had Mark's drum kit set up in it. We had the shed down there then, and we had complaints from neighbours then, it was a bit too oh, much. Oh, one day, they, <laughs> one day they performed in the garden when we were out, yeah, and right, a right. friend of mine around the corner said, we didn't think you would let that happen, Maureen. We must have heard it for miles around. First it was Paradox, which mm. is the heavy metal band. Mm. Then I had Amber Dawn, which is very mm. short-lived, and then it was Karma.
Yeah, and again, well, I wasn't quite happy with a couple of notes that I thought were a bit out of time. <laughs> that's, that's the wall of noise aspect in your solo album. Did you incorporate those elements on purpose to actually challenge your audience because you know that maybe if they are going to buy a solo Stephen Wilson album that they are expecting to have beautiful songs but at some point in the song that you will provoke them with totally different kind of tonalities different kind of frequencies is that a thing you did on purpose or is it just that you wanted to have that noise aspect part of the composition I love that you can write beautiful ballads and you can destroy the mood completely with something unexpected and noise like and that's so that song get all you deserve which starts off as a very melancholic piano ballad and then gradually layers and layers and layers until you've completely obliterated anything that was there at the beginning of the track i've always liked that I, you know i've always admired people that go beyond you know you go you go as far as you think you can possibly go and then you go even further All the internet thing and the download culture and the iPod culture and whatever you call it. It's a very good thing for music. Very, very good thing. One of the best things that happened to music. Well, I don't actually, you might be surprised to hear that I don't disagree with you on that. In fact, I think the internet probably has in many ways liberated music in a way from a, a kind of period of time when it was very much in control of the record companies and in control of marketing and and what the internet did what internet did was was provide an opportunity for artists to go directly to their audience and and and, and obviously you have now a, a groups like Radiohead and Nine Inch Nails making their music directly available over the internet and that, you've got a MySpace and, and I think that's all fantastic. I suppose it's like anything in life that there is plus and negative to anything. Any technological development has its plus and its negatives. The negative side of the internet and iPod culture and download culture is that it has made music devalued to the point where people don't really expect to pay for it and they don't really perhaps absorb it in the same way that they used to. New album is not an... an it's, it's not the event. It's not an event anymore. But it used you know, to be you listen album. to it weeks, yeah. months, like yeah. six months before the, the official release date until, you know, you know, on the day of the official release date, it's, it's an old record. It's interesting. It's an old one. No, I agree. It's interesting, isn't it, that the, the, the big events in the last year have been the release of albums on the internet, download, like the Radiohead in Rainbows. All the press was about the, the, the download release. And when yeah. the album finally came out, it was like, oh, it was the Radiohead album out. I mean, that's interesting, and perhaps there is a way that music will, will kind of gradually move more and more towards that, and you will have the big event releases again, but they'll be virtual download releases. I used to wish I was I was born 20 years earlier because I think yeah. 
in many respects, the golden era of, of music for me still, the late 60s and, and uh, the 70s, there was this incredible explosion of creativity coming out of the kind of singles era and moving in with, with bands like the Beatles and the Beach Boys and Hendrix and The Who and Pink Floyd. Uh, coming out of psychedelic music into progressive music, into art rock, into the great era of the album, when the album really became elevated to the level of a great art form. Whereas before the album had been literally a collection of singles or a collection of songs, suddenly there were people who were looking at the album as an art form in its own right. And there was a great era from 67 through to punk 77, where the album really became the primary art form. And then punk came along, and I think it needed to. I mean, I'm, I'm, I love a lot of punk and post-punk music, but I think punk music really kind of ended the golden era of the album as art form. And so I have a certain nostalgia for that era. I feel like I should have been, you know, in a way, making music at that time. But on the other hand, I feel that's like coming back again. I feel there are, you know, certain artists that are bringing that whole, that whole philosophy back, yeah. whether it's bands like Sigur Ross or Flaming Lips or Tool or Mars Volta or Opeth or whoever it is. There are a lot of bands, I think, really making great albums again. In terms of, of my regrets for the future, it's, it's hard, you know, because the music industry, as, at least the way I know it and the way I love it, is kind of dying to an extent. Yeah. I think it's being reborn into something else, and I'm not quite sure what that thing is yet. suffering or the bad memories are, are as important okay. as the good memories and the good experiences. If you sort of um, can imagine life as being 99% of the time quite linear and most of the time you're in a state of neither happiness nor sadness and then that 1% of the time you experience moments of very crystallized happiness or crystallized sadness or loneliness or depression and I believe all of those moments are very potent. And, and it's, like, it's, like, um, it's like I said to you, that for me, it's mostly those moments, those crystalline moments of, of melancholy, which are more inspirational to me. And in a strange way, they become quite beautiful in their own way. Music that is sad, melancholic, depressing, is in a kind of perverse way more uplifting. I find happy music extremely depressing. Uh, mostly. Mostly quite depressing. It's particularly if it's happy music that has no spirituality behind it. If it's just sort of mindless party music, it'd be quite depressing, you know. But largely speaking, I'd say I was the kind of person that responds more to melancholia, and it makes me feel good. And I think the reason for this is that I think if you, if you respond strongly to that kind of art, it's because in a way it makes you feel like you're not alone. It makes us feel like we're not alone. So when we hear a very sad song, it makes us realize that we do share this kind of common human experience. We're all kind of bonded in sadness and melancholia and depression.
specifically I like the uh, the Victorian sort of late 19th century tradition of taking pictures of the dead almost as if you can preserve their soul somehow in the celluloid or whatever it's made of but also the fact those pictures were so beautiful they were actually pieces of art it wasn't like some cheesy b-movie horror image it was something actually quite beautiful and uh, peaceful and in fact when you looked at those pictures for the first time you didn't realize the babies were dead at all the children were dead it just looked like they were kind of in in repose or in sleep but you knew something was not right and then when you look closer you realize what it was I don't know it's one of the things that scares me about having children thought that you might lose them. Cope and how do you cope with that? And do you ever recover from that? And isn't it easier not just to not have kids at all, you know? Some of these are so human, aren't they? Like this one. blackboards anymore. It's all gone high-tech, white, wipey things. Oh, really? Political correctness gone mad. This is the sports field where I regularly got myself kicked to pieces. When I came, when I came here in uh, 1978, I was like, I was really, really a big football fan. I love football. And uh, so my parents, of course, sent me to a school where they played rugby. And I got the shit kicked out of me. Every day. Right here. Because I was tiny, I was really little as well. I hated it. I hated sport. And this is the art block. Wow, oh, God. This industry, the music industry, is a heartbreaking industry. As, as with any artistic industry, it's a really heartbreaking industry because you have to be able to create something from the heart and then be prepared to have someone trample all over it. The difference is, if, if you, like when I was working for a computer company, I would go to the office nine to five, five days a week. If someone didn't like my work at work, fine. They criticised my work. I didn't take it personally. I went home. It didn't matter. But if someone tells you that the music you've just spent the last year of your life writing, recording, producing, mixing, mastering, touring is a piece of shit, they've actually, what they've effectively done is, is, is they've said that you are a piece of shit. Because the music, the art, is an extension of yourself. That's not true of a jo an office job. The, your, your, your job doing whatever, a cataloging, or whatever it is you're doing or selling computers, that's not an extension of your own personality. But music is, it's a creative expression of your own heart and soul. And so it's really heartbreaking and so many people find that very hard to deal with and, and give up, you know, because, uh, you know, you spend a year making a record and then you see somebody reviewing it say, it's a piece of shit. They've just basically dismissed a whole year of your life. Well, they've dismissed you, they've dismissed you like that. You're worthless, you're a piece of shit. What you're doing is, is pointless. And, and uh, that's very hard to get used to. Very hard to get used to. Razones por las que la industria musical del siglo XXI pesa. Porque toda la música se ha reducido a un software. Porque los MP3 suenan de la verga. Porque la genera las generaciones han crecido con el PD y vienen de un coeficiente intelectual de una música. El estar pendejeando, la letanía de Satanás, que es American Idol, los nuevos reproductores de música, los iPods, que solamente promueven la cultura de los grandes ¡Apatía!
there was times when um, I, f I realized I was doing things for the wrong reason. I was doing things in order to please other people and not myself. And I do, I do believe very strongly that being a true artist means, in fact, being incredibly self-indulgent and incredibly self selfish uh, about what you do. And that self-indulgent and that selfishness is what separates for me an artist from an entertainer. And that's been really my rule for the last 10 years at least, but more than that really. Since Flowermouth, that album, when I really realised that I didn't, I, I felt sick at the idea, I felt physically ill at the idea of making music that I didn't believe in. So my art teacher was a guitar player and he used to have, uh, after school, he used to have little guitar lessons with like three or four pupils. So he taught me some of my first songs and first chords on the guitar. Great guy. Mr. Jackson was his name. And there's a guitar as well. He doesn't still work here, does he, Mr. Jackson? No. It's amazing how everything seems so small, you know. Kind of a man, you remember it as being your whole world. You come back and it's, the rooms are tiny. Este, básicamente es para que este, escuchen su primer este, disco solista. Que avance más. Que avance más. Ah, go ahead. Um, some of you might be wondering why I would make a solo record and uh, what's different about my solo record that you haven't already heard from my other projects. Uh, and hopefully that will become obvious when you hear the record. There you go. That's better. Great. Marvellous times. But the music's good, I think. <laughs>